Hi, good morning, Engine Diagnosis. We're going to be looking at um, engine fundamentals and component relationships um, that we have. When we think about engine components and how they relate together, we're going to think about the materials that we have in different um, engine components, how they work together, how they're configured, what are the wearable parts, where are our common failures. So our goal here is to really take a closer look at, um, at engines. And when we look at engines, um, and, and as we take a closer look, we want to think about um, uh, at a deep. Well, we just want to think about it at a deeper level, not just an auto one or auto two level. So here we go. So let me pull this forward and see if it'll focus a little bit better. Um, there it goes a little better. Um, so what we're going to be doing here is is uh, thinking about first um, number of cylinders and this in some ways is kind of an auto one auto two review so we can have you know three four five six uh, eight ten twelve cylinders there is a three cylinder um, Chevy uh, Geo Metro Chevy Sprint etc we also want to think about the cylinder position so when we say cylinder position or orientation in other words uh, is it a V-type engine? Is it inline? Is it a horizontally opposed pancake engine like a Subaru or a Porsche or an old school Volkswagen? All the old Volkswagens from 1939 to approximately 1986. Here you've got a, uh, a V8 um, overhead cam uh, Ford engine. And as an example there, let's keep going here. So camshaft orientation, is the camshaft in the block or is it up in the cylinder heads? So where is it in relationship? to the, the um, combustion chamber and then valve location and number so in other words um, is are the valves in the block are they in the cylinder head how many do we have and of course everything today is four valves per cylinder and everything today is um, overhead valve and really overhead cam so you can see right here so I take the camera down here and look at this uh, one cylinder head of this V6 Ford engine. You've got two intake valves and two exhaust valves, the intake being the larger valves, intake the exhaust being the smaller valves. And the reason why we've gone, everyone's gone to four valves per cylinder, although I do have a five valve per cylinder over here. There's a little Volkswagen five valve per cylinder head. The reason why we've gone to four valves and five valves per cylinder is because what we found is we can build torque if we can keep the if we can keep the um, velocity of air um, coming into the cylinder, if we can keep that up, we can build torque. We tend to keep the speed up. We get we build torque, and if we um, uh, increase the volume, we tend to increase uh, horsepower. So having multiple valves with small port sizes keeps our velocity up, helps fill the cylinder at low speed, which helps to build torque. But then because we have two of them, we still get good horsepower when we need to really get on the throttle. So here we go. So obviously valve location, number of valves, sorry for that. Um, and then five, air induction system. Is it a naturally aspirated engine? Is it turbocharged, uh, which is an exhaust driven air pump? Is it um, supercharged? And I'll show you a picture of a turbocharger. Here's a really cool picture of a pencil drawing that a student did years ago of a turbocharger. And what you're seeing here in the turbo, if I can get it close enough, so yeah, focusing pretty good. Here's exhaust coming out of a, a, a cylinder and um, going up and coming around and blowing on the turbine impeller to get it spinning at 100,000 RPM, spinning that shaft, which is floating on oil, spinning the compressor turbine, which pumps outside air into a cylinder that's on intake. So an exhaust driven air pump gives us a better way of filling the cylinder. Let me show you a supercharger. So actually, before I show you the supercharger, I want to show you this very cool cutaway of a turbocharger. So on the exhaust side here, let me hold it up this way. Here's the exhaust side and try not to drop it. And there's your, your, um, your turbine impeller spinning the compressor on this side exhaust flowing around getting this guy going this guy over here pumping air 
into a cylinder. And then over here, I'll grab the camera. And here's a supercharger, which is a belt driven compressor. So you can see where the belt drives the, the supercharger there. And then when I turn it up, here you can see the screw inside there forcing the air down inside the engine. Okay? So that's a turbocharger and a supercharger. So that gives us just a little bit about air induction systems. And then number six is fuel type. Whether it's gasoline, whether it's diesel, whether it's compressed natural gas, whether it's fuel cell vehicle, which uh, makes hydrogen, etc., cetera, um, and, and makes electricity. But we'll talk about those as time goes on. So next uh, is number seven is a longitudinal or transverse mounted engine. Again, we're just talking about ways that we configure or classify engines. Is it running front to back, longitudinal, or is it sideways in the engine compartment, which is transverse, meaning the front of the engine is to one side or the other. So let's talk about a cylinder block. And again, I apologize, it's not focusing so, so perfectly on the screen there, but um, we'll try and work on that a little bit. So um, as you can see that I've got up there engine displacement, which is the number of cylinders times the area of the cylinder. So <clears throat> the volume of any cylinder is found by pi r squared, uh, which is the area of the, the, the cylinder or should say the area of a circle, and then times its height, which is the stroke. So the area of the circle times the height would be the volume of that one cylinder. If we have eight, then we need to multiply it by eight. So that's how we come up with um, engine displacement. Um, that's in, we usually, I usually think in cubic inches, and then we can convert cubic inches to liters. There's 61.4 cubic inches to a liter. Okay, so couple things about blocks. First, taper is the difference in wear at the top to the bottom of the cylinder. So the cylinder tends to wear up here at the top because when the piston's at the top of the cylinder, that's where you get the explosion that rattles the piston back and forth and causes it to wear up here. Cylinders will always have what we call a ring ridge or at least a ring shadow, and I'll show you what that is, but that's where the rings stop traveling because you can't bring the rings right up to the top of the cylinder. Um, the cylinders will always be stock size down at the bottom. So we say the difference between the diameter at the top and the bottom is what we call taper. Let me show you a ring ridge so you can see it here on this Lexus V6. All you see here is a little ring shadow, that little brown, about a quarter inch brown line there. That's where the rings stop going up in that V6 cylinder. Let me put this back over here. Okay. Um, so next is sorry dip, four difference between top and bottom there you go next is out of round so if i measure this cylinder across here and i measure it across here and of course this is a cutaway but if i measure it diameter this way diameter this way and i subtract the two that's the amount of out of round or egg shape that the cylinder has and again that can be caused because if you think about a piston like this here's a piston and what you've got is when the piston goes up, I'll do it this way. When we go up in the cylinder and then the rod moves over and then it swings across the top when combustion goes and then starts going down, well, the majority of the force is going to be that way. And we call this the major thrust of the piston. It's going to come up in another slide. This would be the minor thrust of the piston. So, um, so we do get wear, though, in the direction of the skirts right here is what I really should have said, but not in the direction of here where there's no skirt. So in one position, let's say this way, you'll have more wear than you will this way. So cylinders tend to wear in an egg-shaped pattern. And what I've seen over the years with lots of miles um, is if somebody changes the oil, warms it up, you, you'll take an engine apart and you'll have very little taper, if any, and very little out of round, if any. Okay. So ring ridge, again, is that step that you can see right there where the rings stop um, they stop right there. In this cylinder, you can see a little bit of lines up and down, a little bit in the bunch here. So this cylinder obviously had trouble uh, from losing uh, oil and lubrication. Let's look at pistons for a few minutes. So the skirts guide the piston up and down. And again, these are the skirts here and here. So you've got two of them. When we measure a piston, we measure usually about a half inch up from the end of the skirt. 
So we'll put the outside micrometer right across there and we'll measure that piston. And we'll find that the piston is made egg-shaped. It's made larger this way than it is this way. It's round up here at the top where the rings are, um, but it's about 30, 35,000 smaller up at the top where the rings are than it is at the skirts. And that's so that the rings are what's sealing there and not the, um, not the piston actually contacting. You can see that there's a, um, there's a major and minor thrust surface. And again, I wish this would focus better, but it's just not doing a really great job today. But um, there's a major and minor thrust surface here and here. And like I told you, when the piston goes up and it comes around, you get the explosion, it's gonna force the piston this way. So this is the major thrust surface. This is the minor thrust surface. Uh, this diagram is showing some different components of a piston, a valve relief pocket, a dome here for higher compression, a stamping for size, um, some other things, and also showing us our ring grooves and our ring lands there. Um, two types of pistons in terms of how they fit on connecting rods. There's either full floating or press fit pistons. So a full floating piston is like this one, or sorry, press fit pistons like this one where the rod and pin are pressed together. So when I move the pin backwards, the rod goes with it. Here's, a, I believe I have a full floating here. Yes, I do. Here's a full floating. On this one, you can see that the pin is locked in. You can see it just barely. There's a little circlip in there that locks the pin. And so when you look at this, the rod is floating on the pin, and the pin is stationary. This one's easier to take apart, and race cars will use that when they have to take pistons apart. When you have to take a press fit piston apart, you're going to destroy the piston. You have to replace it. The ring lands are these areas between the ring grooves. You can see them here, one, two, three. Those ring lands are just the area that capture the ring top and bottom. And then cam grinding is the egg-shaped nature of the piston where it's larger across the skirts here and obviously smaller this way. It actually has an egg shape, and we do that to reduce frictional drag on the, on the cylinder wall. Okay, So our contact pattern on the cylinder wall should just be this very, very light strip. Let me show you another piston which you can kind of see. So you can see on this worn Lexus piston, where it's kind of white in here and the molybdenum disulfide coating over here was kind of worn off there, you can see the shadowing. And ideally, there's a little bit of a groove, and I can feel, feel it with my fingernail. I feel a little bit of grooving there, and that grooving is to hold oil on the cylinder wall because really we don't want that piston to actually touch the cylinder wall. We want that piston to slide up and down on a little lubricating film of oil, okay? And sorry, egg shape of the piston. Okay, rings are next. Let's see if we can get it to focus. All right, so next we're going to be talking about piston rings, and hopefully we can get the camera to focus for us. Let me see if I can get it to focus. It's just going out of focus here for a moment. See if it comes back in. Hopefully it does good. Okay, there we go. So rings. So all gas pistons have two compression rings, and you can see down in the picture that you've got um, – some com two compression rings here and an oil control assembly. And we're still having trouble focusing the screen. I'm sorry about that. So let's try one more time. We'll give it one more shot and then see if it wants to do it. Okay. Okay. There we go. I don't know why we're having so much trouble focusing. Okay. So here's a piston. And this piston has, you can see this, this Lexus RX 330 piston has two compression rings right up here. They're pretty thin. They're narrow gauge rings. And we'll try and get it to focus again. And there it goes. And you can see the two compression rings there and there and the oil control assembly there. So hopefully it will focus for us again. There it goes. And then we'll have an oil control ring. And I apologize. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble getting this thing to stay focused. And there it goes. So an oil control ring can be one piece or it can be three piece. And um, typically they're three piece. Once in a while they're one piece. And that's so that when the piston goes up, as it comes down, it scrapes the oil off the cylinder wall and the oil falls back into the oil pan. So let me just show you one thing on the piston. So oil will actually go through the expander here. And you can see the expander there. And pistons will have 
oil holes. And these are really hard to see, but you can see a little bit of staining down in there. And there's two oil holes down in there. Let me see if I can get the lighting so you can see it. You can kind of see the staining there, but there's two holes here and here where the oil is going to fall through the skirt and drop down through the center of the piston and go back into the oil pan. Okay. Now, um, next is ring twist. So what happens is when a ring is sealing against the cylinder wall, it's going to twist. And I'm going to show you what I mean by it by drawing a picture over here on the board. So I'll grab the camera and walk you over here to the board. And so I'm going to go ahead and draw a little picture. So let's say this is a ring. And there's the piston it's in the ring land like this. Here's the cylinder wall. So what's going to happen is when the combustion goes up here, combustion is going to come down here. And it's going to push on this. And sometimes we'll have a chamfer on the ring here. And what that'll make happen is the ring will actually twist this direction to catch an edge here. Or sometimes it'll twist like uh, this. And then this edge, if I redraw this over here, the ring will actually, I'm exaggerating, it doesn't twist that much, but it'll actually contact essentially at this point right there and it will tend to seal. Now, it's, again, it's not nearly so exaggerated, but the ring will actually twist um, to in increase the um, sealing of it against the, the cylinder wall. Okay, so that's called ring twist. Okay, so next um, what we have is positioning. So when we put the rings in the engine, they will often have a dot on them, and that dot always goes to the top of the piston. Further, we're always putting the gaps away from each other. So normally when we assemble this, you can see the gaps on these two rings right here. We're normally going to put one compression rings gap all the way around over here and one here. So now they're 180 degrees apart. You can see the gap on this second compression ring there. And you can see the gap over here. And when we install it, we put them together like that. So there's no chance that the two gaps line up and then compression can leak through the gap. When the ring is in the cylinder, the gap between the two ends is right between 10 and 20 thousandths. So two thousandths is the thickness of a hair in your head. So about 10 times the thickness of a hair in your head. So not a lot. It's 10 thousandths to 20 thousandths. But anyways, further, when a ring seals, it gets forced out and down. So it'll twist, but it'll also get forced out and down. And the reason, the way this works, I'll go back to my picture over here. The, the way the force happens is the compression or the combustion gases will come down like this and kind of force it like this and push the ring out in that direction to help it seal. And engineers will design the shape of the, the ring in such a way that it, um, it actually tries to contribute to this force pushing the ring out against the cylinder wall and helping it to seal. Okay, let's keep going here and go on from rings. So now let's talk about the crankshaft. So I've got a number of crankshafts here, and I've got this um, 4.7 liter V8 crankshaft right here in front, and it's got main and rod journals. I'll point this down so you can see it. So it's got um, one, two, three, four, five main journals. Those are the round part of the crank where it bolts into the block. Then it's got one, two, three, four rod journals. And because it's a V8, two rods connect to the same journal. One goes to that bank. The other one goes to that bank. So it's in a V shape. All right. So that's kind of an auto one thing, as you guys know. But you also know that there's main and rod bearings. And here's an example of some big Caterpillar main bearings. Oil comes through the hole here and sp spreads out on this shell insert bearing to so that our crank journal main journal is floating on a pressurized sheet of oil and then the reason for this groove is that oil can go through the hole in the main journal and go oil the rod journal so i'm talking about this right here so you can see the hole in this main journal oil goes into there and then it makes its way and comes out down here on the rod journals 
so that we can oil these while the engine's running. Okay. Our main clearance is going to be anywhere from one and a half to two and a half. That's the clearance of oil that we have to allow a pressurized sheet of oil so that the crank journal is actually not touching the bearing, but it's floating on a pressurized sheet of one and a half to two and a half thousandths thick of oil. If our oil pressure is roughly 60 PSI, maybe 65 PSI at uh, 3,000 RPM, 70 miles an hour, maybe slightly less in RPM, we've got oil filling up that clearance, so we're actually spinning the crankshaft on a pressurized sheet of oil. So obviously having no contaminants in there and keeping the oil clean is super, super important. Rod clearance is even tighter, about one to two. So blonde hair is about one thousand thick, one and a half thousand thick. Uh, dark hair is more like two to two and a half. So that's that's really, really thin amount of clearance for oil. Plastic gauge. What you've got here in the picture is plastic gauge here and plastic gauge here. Plastic gauge is a strip of what looks like, believe it or not, it kind of looks like dental floss. And um, the plastic gauge is a little strip. We put it on the crank journal and then we took take the new bearing with no oil on it, bolt the cap on, whether we're doing rods or mains, torque it, untorque it, and we see how far, how wide it's squished out the plastic gauge. You can see this little shadow from the plastic gauge, and on the wrapper, it has a gauge, and you compare it to the size, you go, oh, the further out, the wider it is, the less clearance you have. And so on this little wrapper, I think he's, I think it's probably a two thousandths clearance. So he's able to check his oil clearance when he's putting new bearings in to make sure that the clearance is correct. So plastic gauge is a really useful tool. Machine shop guys kind of mock it and oh, it's kind of archaic. It's a, but it's a great way to double check and make sure the bearings were packaged correctly and crank was machined correctly. Because when you're putting an engine together, you don't, you can't depend on what other people are supposed to have done. You've got to check and make sure it's going to work out okay. That's plastic gauge. It's a way of checking oil clearance. Next, the crankshaft further has got counterweights to offset the piston rod combo. Remember when we throw a piston up towards top dead center, we've got to throw weight down or we would have a dramatic vibration. You can see on this crankshaft here, it's counterweighting. So you've got a big heavy counterweight here and it's opposite the rod journal. So when the rod is up, the counterweight's down. Same thing here is another one. There's another one there. So you've got all kinds of counterweighting to offset the weight of the rod piston combination being thrown to the top of the cylinder. We've got oil, rod, oil holes to the rods. Normally, or at least to be that we would only get oil to the rods 50% of the time, and that was problematic. So a lot of cranks are drilled through the center. So this one here is cross-drilled. So you see this one's got a hole on this side. And it's got a hole on this side. And the net result is oil goes to these rods 100% of the time. And that's the way you want it. And that keeps the engine alive. There's a thrust surface on the crankshaft. So we have to keep the crankshaft from being able to move in and out of the engine. So when you're running, the crankshaft might want to move forward or it might want to move back. So what we've got to do is one of the main bearings is going to have a thrust surface. It's going to look like this. It's going to, this is a main bearing for a 5.7 liter Chevrolet. It's got these flanges. And so what happens is as the crankshaft moves this way, it, the machine surface in here on the main journal, sorry, on the main journal right here, is going to hit this surface. And these two little eyebrows there and there let oil spread out on this side so that if the crankshaft wants to move back and forth, it touches on both sides a bearing surface, which is a soft wearable surface that has oil on it. What the net result is that we control the crankshaft's forward and aft movement on, you know, towards the front, towards the back. Normal end play in a crankshaft is four to six thousandths. We say four to go forward, aft to go after, uh, to the rear. And, um, and so that's the thing. You've got to control the crankshafts being pushed in or out of the engine. So on the crankshaft, um, we always have a harmonic balancer. A harmonic balancer on every engine like this one has a steel hub with a rubber insert and then an outer steel hub. And it's going to dampen out what we call harmonic vibrations or torsional vibrations. And this picture over here is showing the tool that's used to remove it. I'm going to grab the camera. We'll walk over here to um, this engine over here and look at the harmonic balancer that this engine has. If my camera will let me go here. So you can see the 
um, accessory pulley here, but this rusty one back here is a harmonic balancer. And you can see the rubber insert, so two-piece there. Every engine has one. This engine here, if I can pull my camera just a little further, this one's painted, but again, you can see the rubber insert, and it's two-piece. Every engine has to have a harmonic balancer, every engine. And those are pretty modern engines there, only about 12 years old, um, those Ford engines. And so here we are back in, in our spot. And um, and so um, just showing you that that's that wheel on the front. And so most of them are separate from the accessory um, pulley, but the second engine I showed you over there, Actually, it was one piece. The crankshaft, or the accessory belt, ran around that harmonic balancer. That's a little, that's a little more atypical. It's not usual. Okay. So when we talk about the camshaft, we want to look at several things. So we can either have what's called a flat tappet or a roller camshaft. So let me show you the two types. So here's a roller, and here's a flat tappet. And this one's worn really bad, but that's supposed to be flat. And this one has a roller. Well, obviously, this one has a lot higher frictional component than this does. So we like rollers on everything. There's a roller there. Those are two uh, camshafts here. This is a flat tappet cam here. And this is a roller cam here. This one is an overhead camshaft where the cam rolls on that roller lifter there. Sorry, roller rocker. And then there's a lifter there, a hydraulic lifter that keeps it pumped up to keep the clearance out and keep it quiet. And when the roller comes around, it pushes down, or sorry, when the cam load comes around, it pushes on the roller and opens the valve. This is showing a um, overhead cam with some sort of a roller device on it. Okay. Um, uh, cams can be what we call hydraulic or mechanical. We're re referring to the lifter mechanism. This is a hydraulic lifter. You can see a little hole there where oil goes in pumps this guy up so when it's off cam there is a little bit of clearance but we take that clearance up with oil just so it doesn't make noise um, it doesn't open the valve it lets the valve close remember we close the valve for two reasons one to seal compression two to let it sit down the valve sit down in the seat and cool so it dissipates some of that excess 2500 degrees fahrenheit of combustion chamber temperature okay um, obviously the lobes are eccentrics so there's the eccentric lobe there to come around and open the valve by pushing down on whatever type of mechanism we have. So a lot of engines, a lot of modern engines, Toyota doing this in particular, they'll bring their cam around and they just have a hardened steel um, cam bucket that sits right on top of the valve and this comes around and just wipes right on there. Both are hardened, there's oil between, there's no hydraulic lifter, there's no adjustment, there's no roller mechanism and that's how they do it. Toyota does it on a lot of their engines. Um, if, if you have a roller type mechanism, it's going to reduce friction, but but this design I just show you has a lot less parts and a lot less weight, etc. And they work good. So what this next slide is showing is the what's called the lift duration and lobe center of a camshaft. So the lift is the height of the lobe, how far it opens the valve. And so you can see that on this diagram, we're measuring the lift from down here at zero to up to the top. The duration, we start measuring at 50 thousandths of lobe open, our, our valve opening and 50 thousandths before valve closing. And we say the degrees of rotation here is, we measure it this way, is the duration, how long the valve is open. The lobe separation is how far apart the tip of the exhaust and the tip of the, um, uh, sorry, the exhaust and the intake is. If we bring the lobe centers closer, then we get more valve overlap, so the engine doesn't want to idle well. It does what it makes a lopy idle, that kind of thing that we see at the drag races. No extra charge on the sound effects, by the way. But anyways, if we split those lobe centers apart, the engine runs smoother at low RPM, has better torque, but doesn't have as much horsepower. So we, we usually talk about 110 degree or 112, or even 114 degree lobe center is a more smoother idling, uh, more street drivable car, um, better gas mileage, more torquey. Um, when we get to 10, 110, 108, 106, now we're getting a lobe. Um, we may have a lot of valve overlap. We have a, a really lopy idle. Sounds really cool, makes a lot of horsepower, but uses a lot of fuel, pollutes the environment, things like that. Next, a little bit about cam timing. Um, sorry, 
a little bit about cam time. Cam time is when the valves open. So when you look at this picture of this camshaft, old school, we could actually put a degree wheel on here and we line the marks up so it's supposed to be zero. We actually look at it with a degree wheel and say, oh, we want to change this. We want to make it two degrees advanced or four degrees advanced. The more advanced we get, we typically build torque and lose horsepower. We get, but we can change the keyway or the dowel for the cam gear to an offset one. We can actually change it. Well, nobody does this anymore because all modern cars are variable valve timing, variable cam timing, meaning as you go down the road and accelerate, it'll actually change the relationship of the camshaft to the crankshaft. So that's cam timing, and that'll help uh, torque, and it'll, it'll help uh, fuel economy, etc. Just want to show you cam bearings. There's a set of full circle cam bearings that go in a cast iron block where the cam is in the block. Here's a big block Chevy, and there, I think it's a big block Chevy. Let me take a look. Could be a small block, actually. I can't tell 100%. Could be a small block. But they're, that's a camshaft um, driver, and they're driving. Uh, looks like they're putting new bearings in. We do have one of those cam drivers. We have to remove cam bearings when we um, rebuild an engine. And before we put the block in the hot tank, you can't put bearings in. We'll destroy the, the bearings will get destroyed by the solution. So in hydroxide. And, um, and then we can drive some new ones in with that cam driver. And so it's a special tool. We do have it, etc. Okay, so timing components. So what you've got here in the picture is um, a chain drive gear uh, uh, engine. So starting in, um, well, up until about the mid-late 80s, we always ran chains to connect the cam and crank. In the late 80s uh, through the 90s, we used timing belts because they were quieter, they were lighter. But then we found out we had to keep changing them every either 60K or some 90K, some 105K, some 120K. And, and customers are like, I don't want to re replace a timing belt at the cost of six or $800 when the engine's running fine. What they don't understand is that timing belt will eventually break and valves will hit pistons and destroy the engine. So in about 2004, roughly, depending on the manufacturer, we went back to chains. So here's a modern car with a chain. It's a roller type chain with a oil pressure activated tensioning system with a guide rail here. And this one's got a guide rail here to keep the slap out of the chain. So I'll show you one over here on this um, this overhead cam engine. And what you've got here is here's a modern overhead cam engine. There's the crankshaft. The gear here is half the size of this because it spins twice for every one cam revolution. And this is a link belt um, type chain. And um, we've got these Teflon coated um, guide rails. And we have an oil pressure tensioner. So in order for the chain to run up around and not get slapping around and change cam timing, we've got to have tension on that chain. So sorry about the little dizziness here walking over. But um, that's what modern cars look like when they're overhead cam now and they have a chain and they're trying to control the, the timing of the chain and the slap of the chain, etc. A couple other things about chains. We can have what's called a roller, a true roller, or a link belt. So, this is a link belt chain right here. It's kind of got a funny looking style. They're pretty strong. Here's a double roller chain, which we consider to be a better, stronger chain. And then a true roller chain actually has rollers. The inside of this actually rolls. So when it hits the gear, it actually can move with it. So these are a little less friction, a little less wearing. They last a little bit longer. So for performance, we like um, true roller chains. Um, we like to to use them. Okay. Um, so a little bit about gears. So we can have a gear drive like this, very noisy, sounds kind of cool, makes it sound like you got a supercharger. Um, gears can be steel, they can be fiber, they can be aluminum, they can be plastic. I know it sounds weird. Chevy in the mid 80s, 5.7s used uh, steel gear, aluminum gear actually with plastic teeth on it. And eventually they they cracked and broke, and then the chain slipped, and then valves hit pistons, and the rest was history. Um, nobody uses gear drives anymore because we're all over in cam, so we've got to have a chain. Um, if we had a belt, like it says here, many cars were changed at 60K. A lot are changed at 105. I just showed you the guide rails, and I showed you the oil pressure tensioner. This one's a spring-loaded tensioner. This is less typical, but this would be like a 90s uh, dual overhead cam Honda. Let's look at cylinder heads. So what you've got here, so 
what you have with cylinder heads is um, you have a lot to talk about, okay? So first, we're going to talk about the ports, which is the passage leading to the valve. So here's a port here, and this diagram is really, really descriptive. So there's the intake manifold runner. Here's the port in the cylinder head. We call this the port roof, the port floor. We call this the short-turn radius. We call this the long-term radius or the back wall. We call this the throat down here. So a guy that's doing porting to get more power out of an engine, he's concerned with all these angles and grinding things out and making them smooth and um, trying to increase horsepower and torque. The combustion chamber here in the right underneath the the bottom part of the cylinder head, you can see this bowl, if you will, around this Honda with the three valves per cylinder is a combustion chamber. That's where our explosion is going to go, and that obviously dictates the size of the chamber is a big factor in dictating our compression ratio. Head surface here it needs to be nice and flat. We want this thing to be um, on a four-cylinder engine like this. We put a straight edge across. We put a 1,000th feeler gauge in it. We want it to drag that feeler gauge. We don't want any more than 2,000th of an inch warp. We want it less. We want to pull a half thou feeler gauge or 1,000th feeler gauge. We want to pull the straight edge and not pull out from underneath it, meaning it's flatter than that, um, that value. You can see the cooling and oil passages. If you look at this cylinder head, this, here's the head bolts. One, two, three, four, five. I'll use my little pointer to help here. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. These two look wider because they have a dowel that goes in there. That's a hollow dowel that aligns this head on this uh, this head on the cylinder block. Here's the water jack holes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Going around that engine. This might be one here. Water, water here, 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 here. Water here. All these. What are these three? These are oil drain back holes, so oil that you pour into the, the um, oil-filled neck up at the top of the valve cover goes down through the top of the cylinder heads, drops through the cylinder heads, through the block, and down to the oil pan. This is going to be an oil pressure hole right here. That's where oil is pressurized coming from the oil pump to lubricate the cams and all the mechanisms up above. Let's keep going forward. Um, on your bolt holes, these bolt holes can be blind or open to coolant. So most engines have blind holes, meaning there's a back on it. It doesn't go through. Small block Chevys forever always went through the water jacket. So when you assemble a small block Chevy, you always had to put sealer on the head bolt threads so that no water would make its way up through the, the threads of the bolt and get, um, get out. Um, we have what's called torque to yield head bolts. Torque to yield head bolts are head bolts that we use for aluminum heads that we actually torque, let's say, to 15 or 25 PSI, and then it tells us to turn it an additional 90 degrees, and then another 90 degrees. And the reason why we do that is we're trying to achieve a bolt clamping force by actually stretching the bolt. And so this, the bolt has some percentage of elasticity, so it's going to hold like a clamping force on, on the cylinder head. And we find that the engineers find that if we stretch the bolt by going to a certain torque and then going 90, then going 90, we actually get a better seal when we have dissimilar metals like aluminum cylinder head on a cast iron block with a head gasket in between. Head gaskets are always um, multi-layered. So here's a head gasket off a three liter dual over or single overhead cam four runner engine here. It's got kind of a funny combustion chamber shape, shape there. So that's why that's like that. You can see that this one's blown over here. Hopefully you can see that that's damaged there. Oh. There it goes to the floor, and you can see that this one's damaged here. You can see all the damage to this head gasket right here, and you can see the firing ring, the metal firing ring that's damaged there. These were notorious for needing head gaskets on the back cylinder of that V6 that was in all those early, mid-90s uh, uh, forerunners that were the three-liter engine, not the dual overhead cam three-liter that's in the late model Camrys and Avalons and Lexus, but it's in it's the early generation single overhead cam, three liter V6. So let's talk some more about valves, uh, uh, valve parts, cylinder head parts, talk about valves, intake and exhaust valves. So that I'm just going to show you the parts of the valve. I'm going to get my top fuel intake valve. Here's um, it's a titanium valve. This is the head of the valve here, big head there. Secondly, we have the, um, the margin is the distance. And I'll show you on this one over here. It's a little bit easier to see. 
the margin is the difference between the end of the head and the face of the valve. So that's that thickness there. It's usually we like it to be oh, close to an eighth inch, uh, maybe maybe a hundred thousandths. Um, the fillet radius on the valve is this guy right here, okay, or this guy right here, the fillet radius. So sometimes in intake valves, we get carbon on the fillet radius. That's the stem right there. That's the part that guides the valve up and down so the seat will sit on, the valve face will sit on the seat properly. The tip, of course, is where the, you're pushing with a rocker or a lifter or whatever you have, not a lifter, but a tap it, whatever you have, sorry, not a lifter or a tap it but either a rocker or some sort of cam follower like a bucket taper and sometimes we get taper on the stems and when we do we start to um, get the valve to move around not sit down right we don't seal compression properly we don't cool the engine properly and then we cut we get valves with different coatings so sometimes you'll see a kind of a black coating on here and that's a molybdenum disulfide coating it's sort of self-lubricating in its own properties and um, it helps the wear, valves to wear longer and i really like I like using valves that have that coating on there. A little bit more on valves is valve guides or valve related stuff is valve guides. So guides are the tubes in here that locate the valve so the valve sits down properly on the seat. And when it sits down properly on the seat, it's going to cool the valve, it's going to seal compression, etc. Guides can be made of either cast iron, silicon bronze or phosphorus bronze. Silicon bronze and phosphorus bronze are very very tough materials phosphorus bronze in particular. Um, cast iron is a little bit more forgiving. These can tend to, these materials can tend to wear the valve stem out, whereas cast iron doesn't usually wear the valve stem out. We like using cast iron because if you look at it through a microscope, the structure is kind of granular and it's kind of wavy. And so in the low voids, oil will sit and it'll tend to hold oil and lubricate the valve as it's moving up and down. Um, Guides can be either pressed in or cast as one piece. So I'm going to show you a cast iron pressed in um, uh, valve guide. And so this is what's used to be pushed into a, a cylinder head. And then this can be pushed into an aluminum cylinder head or it can be pushed into a cast iron cylinder head. And it's going to guide the valve stem so that the valve sits on the seat. And as we already said, seals compression and gets cooled. All right, valve springs are next. So valve springs are used to close the valve after the cam, after we go off cam, meaning after the eccentric lobe of the cam turns away from where the valve is. So valve springs can be straight or conical. And most, a lot of modern cars have conical valve springs. And one of the reasons why they use a conical one is because as you press it down, its rate of tension goes up um, geometrically. It doesn't go up in a linear fashion. So um, we will use different kinds of springs. These are both, this one here is a straight, not, it's not a conical and it's a single spring, whereas that one's a double spring. This one's a conical, but it's a single spring. Um, we look at them for their squareness. We check them with a straight edge against it to make sure they're square. We look at their color to make sure they're not discolored from heat. We check their tension with a spring compressor. We're going to look at what's called coil bind. We want to make sure that when the cam that we use pushes the valve all the way open, the coils aren't going to stack on each other and bind together. We also look at the, the retainer here to make sure the retainer is not going to hit the top of the guide or the seal that's on the guide. And then we look at the open and close pressure of the spring when it's installed to make sure it has enough pressure to close the valve after the cam lobe rotates away from its open position. So there's a lot to think about with springs. And usually when we're thinking about a lot of these things is when we're making aftermarket changes. We're putting a different cam with more lift and duration, um, something like that. Okay. Valves use keepers, which are valve locks. They're a tapered lock that wedge into the valve itself. The valve has a groove like this where the locks fit in. And they hold the retainer, so which holds the spring, so it can't come off of the valve. Here's um, some valve stem seals here that pound down over the top of the guide to control the amount of oil going down into the guide. We do want some oil, but not too much. So for seals, we can use some sort of a positive seal like this, or like Chevy's 
We used to use an O-ring seal, and some cars we use what we call an umbrella seal. So the seals that I have to show you, this is kind of a kind of an umbrella seal. Yeah, it's really an umbrella seal, although it does push down on the top of the guide. But it's not a positive seal where it doesn't have some sort of a snap ring, unlike many of them do. But all those seals are just used to control the quantity of oil that's going down between the valve stem and the valve uh, guide. We have valve rotators or retainers. The retainers um, hold, I'm trying to grab them here for you. A valve retainer is going to hold the um, spring to the valve. So here's a valve and here's a retainer and this is going to go on here and then we're going to put keepers in there and that's going to lock this on so the spring doesn't come off. Okay. A rotator, I don't have one to show you, but a rotator is some cars want to rotate the valve. They feel it does better for cooling and sealing by to keep the valve spinning a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. So next is manifolds. So we don't have too much more to do, but we're going to look at intake manifolds. So we've got intake manifolds. We have upper and lower intake manifolds. Typically, the lower intake manifolds that are bolted to the engine are usually aluminum. And then sometimes on top, we'll have a, a plastic manifold, or we could have and aluminum one. Sorry that the camera's having so much trouble holding focus. But what you're seeing here is this is a little bit of an older design where this manifold bolts down here right to the cylinder head. The four runners go up to this plenum, which is this common area. The throttle body bolts on right here. That's where the throttle plate would be. So this is a one piece aluminum manifold. It's a little more atypical. Um, let me show you um, over here on one of these new engines. Let me show you a plastic intake manifold. Again, sorry if I'm making you dizzy, but if I come over here and I get this cord up here, well, here's an intake manifold. There's the throttle there, and air is coming in like this and then going down to the six cylinders. There's a, there's a runner there and there's a runner there, but that's all plastic. This intake manifold is also plastic where air comes through the throttle body, goes down like this, and then comes up through these four runners here and then into the cylinder head. But there's an example of a more modern um, plastic manifold. And then over here is a little more of an old school Toyota, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, one piece. Well, it's actually a two piece. You can see it's bolted together right down here. Hopefully, you can see that. The throttle body's here, the plenum's here. You got long runners, and they're trying to make this long turn to get a fair amount of distance because we find if we put the air through a fairly long runner that's fairly small diameter, we can make um, we can make good torque. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull out some intake manifolds down here. So let me set the camera down. And I'll put it down so you're looking at the table there, and I'll pull these out. And this is a Ford manifold that has what we call runner control. So what this is is a lot of cars have gone to runner control, and runner control is used like this. If the idea of it is We've got two runners, two tubes going into the cylinder head. So this is the upper intake manifold, and it's upside down right now. And you'll notice that air comes in the throttle body here. Let me open the throttle plate here. Hopefully you can see that there. Air goes in there, and it goes this way, and it goes that way. And so you have two runners coming off here, and this one goes to air to this guy. And this one goes over to here. Now, you'll notice that this one, the short runner, goes to a wider diameter runner than this one. This one's a smaller diameter runner, but this one's longer. Air goes through the long one for torque and the short one for horsepower. So each cylinder has a long and a short one or a wide port and a short port, or a narrow port. So what we have is you can see these butterflies here. If you look down inside, you can see them closing there. Okay, and the idea is that at low speed torque, we leave these closed. So air only goes through these small runners that makes good torque for the engine and good gas mileage. When we want to get power, we open up these, and now air is going through both, both the long runner here and the short runner there. So again, like on this cylinder that's going to one of these over here, this is the short runner, and then this is the long runner, but both are taking air to the cylinder. So for horsepower, we have two runners that are letting air in because this, this butterfly is open. 
and we keep the velocity high by keeping the diameter small. And um, so you put air through a tube that's a smaller rather than a larger one. You'll increase its diameter and really help it with torque, which is good for gas mileage, which is good for low speed power. And when you get them both open, you have enough uh, air volume to meet the needs for horsepower on upper engine or upper upper side of the power range. Exhaust manifolds can be either made of cast iron or stainless. Most of them are, like, are cast iron. Um, really rough ones, old ones, we call it pig iron, really low quality iron. Um, most manifolds are made of a little bit better quality these days. This is obviously a very, very fancy stainless steel um, tubular exhaust manifold. Um, we can tune the runners. So we want the, the exhaust, the length of each runner to be the same. So they bend these like this because their distance from here to here is shorter than this distance from here to here. So they're bending them to make these be the same length as these. So the exhaust is going out of each cylinder at the same rate, which affects horsepower in each cylinder. So this is called a header where you have an individual exhaust runner that finally comes down into a collector. A regular exhaust manifold, well, they just dump right out into a common area and then they all go down to the pipe. Um, this one's a lot more power and it's more expensive, etc., and sometimes hard to seal. Engine covers. So we've got an oil pan, which can be steel or aluminum. Sure like those modern oil, aluminum oil pans with their O-ring seals because they just don't leak very much. You guys think steel is stronger. Really, cast aluminum is, is really rigid and does really good on leaks. Maybe it's not as forgiving as steel. Steel will tend to bend when you hit it on a rock or a curb or something. Aluminum tends to crack, um, so it's not as forgiving that way. But we sure like it for being better at sealing. Our valve covers can be steel, aluminum, or plastic. We do not like those plastic ones. Uh, they are light, um, but they're kind of noisy, and they don't seal real good. We really like the aluminum ones. They seal real good. Uh, aluminum is roughly 30% uh, lighter than steel, roughly, approximately. Okay. Timing covers can be steel, aluminum, or plastic. This is an aluminum uh, timing cover, and most of the uh, timing covers have been either aluminum or plastic for a long time. Again, we don't really care for the plastic ones. They don't seal so well. Aluminum ones do really well. Um, if we don't keep our coolant clean, we used to have troubles on corrosion of the aluminum because you get two dissimilar metals like an aluminum block, sorry, a cast iron block, cast iron cylinder heads, and you have an aluminum front cover like on this Ford V8 engine, and you don't keep the coolant clean, you start getting acidic pH level in the coolant, and you start uh, creating a very, basically a battery action, and you start uh, corroding um, the aluminum away. Gaskets can be rubber, cork, or the O-ring style. Um, the, I like the rubber ones better over the cork. The cork tends to squeeze out more than the matte rubber ones, but the O-ring style is by far the best, and that's what we're using on most all aluminum parts. And so here's one here. This is a front cover for this V6 Ford. It's a modern one. It's aluminum. You can see the groove here. That's where our little uh, rubber seal goes and rubber seal goes. These can't squeeze out. And these don't leak. They're really nice the way they've come up to design those covers with those what we call O-ring style seals so they don't leak. Okay, well, that's it on our engine component fundamentals and relationships. Hopefully there's a lot of good things for you guys to think about um, and to talk about, and we'll continue from here. There you go.